My name is Susan Pond. I have the honor of being president of the Royal Society of New South Wales, a 200-year-old learned society dedicated to a public interdisciplinary discussion of important matters in the sciences and humanities. And I'm delighted to welcome you to part two of this special two-part series on Australia's energy future, presented by two Royal Society of New South Wales fellows, Dr. Saul Griffith and Addie Patterson. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which each of us is living, learning and working today. We pay our respects to elders past and present. We extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples during this meeting. Saul Griffith is internationally recognised for his detailed studies on national and global energy systems. Just as importantly, he's known for promoting solutions, solutions to which each and every one of us can relate. Hence the short titles of this two-part series, Context and Castles, which aired on the 25th of August, and today's part two on Crushed Rocks. In the, uh, during the first uh, part of the series, we invited the audience to submit questions to be addressed in this part two. You will find Saul's extensive biography on the Society's website link that features this event. Dr. Abby Patterson joined Saul in the series as moderator interlocutor and expert on energy in his own right. Addy has wide-ranging experience in energy policy, energy systems, technology and innovation. His full, fuller bio is also available on the website. In this series, Saul and Addy set out to show you the solutions for our energy future that will greatly favour not only Australia, but also the planet. Today, in this second part on crushed rocks, Saul will tell us about the arsenal that Australia can bring to bear on lowering emissions uh, from its export economy. He will then engage in a conversation with Ali, based in part on the questions submitted by you, the audience, during part one. So welcome, Saul and Abby. Hi, I'm Saul Griffith, and I'm here to talk to you about rewiring Australia, which is really uh, the plan or suggestion that we should electrify everything or very nearly almost everything with utmost urgency if we're to hit a climate target that we should be aspiring to for our children, our loved ones, something like one and a half degrees. This is part of a two part talk I gave the first about a few weeks ago. It was about our castles or our households. Today it's about our crushed rocks. You could also describe these as metaphors for the domestic economy and how we do things locally and our export economy. Um, or colloquially, it's about savings in the suburbs and jobs in the regions, which is really what is possible if we tackle climate aggressively through electrification. So part two, crushed rocks. Um, I'm going to quickly go over uh, my background, then what we spoke about last time, our castles and households. Then we're going to talk about exports. Um, and then we're going to talk about land use in the context of just how much energy we could export. We're going to talk about hydrogen just to really get a deeper understanding of how that plays in here. We're going to, and you know, spoiler alert, not, not as much as you think. We're going to talk a lot about how it's more likely to play out by embedding energy in our exports. Um, how Australia really will be the world's foundry given our metallic ores and, and metals and possibilities there. And we're going to wrap up with the advantages of electrifying everything. So me, uh, I got my PhD at MIT many years ago. I'm a new member of the Royal Society. I just finished a book called Electrify coming out with MIT Press in about four weeks. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and engineer by day. 
started these companies, most of them in the energy or in the robotics space, uh, including wind, solar, hydrogen, and energy storage. Um, and I have a funny hobby, which is um, extreme energy data or understanding energy flows um, for countries, for the world, for states and regions, um, pretty much all of it. I also last year founded an organization called Rewiring America, um, which is advocating for America to go um, very aggressively at solving climate change and for the positive economic um, and sociological and environmental effects of that. And, and we're doing the same here in Australia, starting an organization to advocate for that. So castles, um, as you know, we're in a bit of a tight pinch. We, we should have started 30 or 40 years ago on climate change. It's been pretty well understood since the seventies, what needed to happen. Um, our current policy, you know, with, with no climate policies at all, we might scrape in four or five degrees of warming. Current policies, if we stick to them, which is a big if, probably get us around three degrees. Our pledges and targets around two and a half. But pretty much all climate scientists now recognize we should be shooting for one and a half, and we're already at 1.1, which means the time has pretty much run out. The dotted lines here are the emission trajectories you'd have to hit for one and a half degrees or two degrees if you don't allow for any negative emissions. The dark blue and light blue lines are the SSP 1 2.6 and SSP 1 1.9. They are the two most aggressive emission um, trajectories from the most recent IPCC AR6 report. They assume enormous quantities of negative emissions after the middle of this century, which is the only way they can get the books to pencil out. Um, spoiler, they're probably not going to happen in the quantities. They, they, these rely on burying quantities of carbon dioxide in the latter half of the century every year that are equivalent to the 10 gigatons of fossil fuels we pull out of the ground every year. So we've got to stuff that much back in the ground every year. I think that's a little bit unlikely and we should be cautious and we should be trying to stick to the trajectory on the far left. And then we're going to be talking about how Australia could contribute to that. Uh, Australia is very unusual in the world. We look more like a petro state than an advanced nation. Um, we export a huge amount of emissions in the form of our coal, uh, thermal coal and metallurgical coal, also in our liquid natu liquefied natural gas, LNG. Um, quite a large portion, 40%-ish of our domestic economy is actually energy being used to enable those exports. Um, by by not only in agriculture, but um, mining, finding, refining, and transporting those fossil fuels. And then you can see our domestic economy in the bottom. Uh, what we also learned in the house uh, story last week was electrification is the key to efficiency. We had 50 years of uh, energy policy that was based around Fish, more efficient cars. That was our cafe fuel standards in the US that affected the whole world's cars getting more efficient. And Energy Star appliances, which was trying to make our appliances more efficient. Um, that can give you one or two percent gains a year. But if you just go to a completely electric car, pound for pound or kilogram for kilogram to a petrol car, it uses about one third or less of the energy if it's powered with solar or wind or nuclear. Similarly, if we use heat pumps um, instead of furnaces, furnaces can get one or 2% more efficient. Um, you know, natural gas heating machinery for space heating and water heating. Um, but if we electrify using heat pumps, heat pumps are quite amazing. They can now produce three or four times as much heat per unit of energy as the electricity that goes into them. Uh, Similarly, if we use clean electrification, so wind and solar to create electricity instead of coal and natural gas, we eliminate two thirds of the waste heat, which is what happens when we generate electricity with fossil fuels. Those efficiencies really add up. You could in fact run the Australian economy on less than half of the energy it does today um, if we were to electrify all of the end users. 
42% of our domestic economy emissions emanate from decisions made around the kitchen table. So this is to say that there is something substantive that people, individuals, households in Australia can do. Um, it's the question of what fuels our cars, what heats our home, where does that electricity come from and how the fuel's made. Uh, energy expenditures are significant, four to $5,000 per household in Australia on our electricity, our gas, our petrol and diesel. Um, we need to go from model of homes that look like this. And in Australia, it's about 1.8 cars in the garage running on probably one petrol, one diesel. Natural gas or propane running in the kitchen, probably natural gas, maybe heating oil or something else, heating the house and electricity coming in. We need to get to here. As much rooftop, rooftop solar as we can support. Two electric vehicles, electric induction cooking, heat pumps for space heat and water heat, probably a home battery to make it all balance. What happens when we do that? Well, currently the average Australian household uses about 13 kilowatt hours of electricity every day. Um, if we include the thermoelectric waste of generating that electricity as it's done today, and if we include the energy in our petrol and diesel, actually the average Australian household uses that third column, about 100 kilowatt hours per day. If we electrified absolutely everything and power it with clean electricity, however, you only need 36 kilowatt hours. So we nearly triple our total electricity demand, but it's one third of our total energy demand. And that's what we, uh, another one of the things we have to win. These are the cost trends of solar, of batteries, of electric vehicles, and of heat. Everything is getting a little bit cheaper, um, particularly the batteries in blue and the electric vehicles in purple. And that's why if you set out on to pay retail prices to electrify everything in a household today, your costs after financing those things would probably increase for energy by about $8,000 a year. But they're falling so quickly that by 2023 or 2024, we hit the crossover point where every household starts to save money. And by 2030, we're saving $5,000 per household for the average household in Australia. That's quite extraordinary. If we added all that up across our 10 million homes, uh, which will increase uh, slowly over that period, we'll be saving $65 billion a year uh, in our energy bills. That would create one and a half million non-energy jobs by how that spending is released elsewhere in the economy, as well as at least half a million energy tradies, uh, because the great majority of the jobs to, to do all of those installs of heat pumps and vehicle charges uh, will be sort of fluoro collar tradie jobs. That brings us to exports. So we have a very positive domestic story for Australia. Um, we also have a positive one for exports, but it might not be exactly what you think. Crush rocks. This is how we crush our rocks today. Um, we export, uh, we earn about $283 billion US dollars in 2019 on exports. Uh, three quarters comes out of the ground. So fossil fuels, you'll see. There, minerals, uh, including iron ore, which is the big one, and metals between them, that's three quarters of all of our exports. About an eighth is agriculture, which is dominated by wine, wheat, wool, and meat. Um, our imports are much smaller, about 208 billion US dollars in 2019. One of the largest is actually our cars. The other largest are our fossil fuels. So our, uh, we you have to import petroleum and oil to feed those cars. Um, and we run a surplus of about $75 billion, which is partly responsible for the high quality of life uh, that Australians lead. Um, interesting story about our fossil fuel exports though. Uh, we export about 130 billion Australian dollars worth of fossil fuels. Uh, mostly coal, roughly half-half metallurgical coal and thermal coal, um, quite a lot of LNG. Uh, but we import, as I said earlier, a lot of oil and a lot of petroleum products, about $40 billion worth. But we have to pay full price for the imports, but we only earn the profit margin on the exports. And those margins, even if we're very generous in the assumptions we make, don't add up to as much as our imports, so maybe $36 billion. So net net, our fossil fuels don't even make money. So this idea that we can't afford 
to transition is quite ridiculous as laid out by this slide, given that all the coal and all the LNG we export barely, no, it actually doesn't even buy us our petrol and diesel. So if we were making all of our energy locally uh, and using all of our green electricity locally, we could be in a much better place. So here it is again, about 21,500 petajoules per year of energy for the whole economy. 15,000 petajoules is exported. Uh, about 3,200 petajoules is what we would need for the domestic economy if we electrified everything and we did it renewably. That's it. Those are important numbers to remember um, because there's sort of the question on people's lips about well, if what are going to be our exports? And I think there's a nice idea that we're going to be more than 100% renewable. It's going to be a future of abundance. Uh, coming from history where everyone was like, oh, how do we get to 100? I think it's quite refreshing to now imagine how do we get to 200, 500, 700. All right, is, to, you know, is 100 possible uh, with renewables or is 500 or 700 possible? Let's have a look. Uh, land use. So this is how... Australia is divided up today. We have um, close to 8 million square kilometres. Um, the largest use of our square kilometres is for grazing beef, um, which has its own emissions problem. So, you know, 40% of the country is grazing native vegetation. Uh, also some sheep out there, some goats. Uh, let's compare our 700% renewable target, 21,000 petajoules. If we did it all with wind, we'd need that giant blue square there. If we did it with 50-50 wind and solar, which is a more likely mix, you'll need that green square. 100% solar is that yellow square. You can see the corresponding squares if we do it with renewable, uh, renewable energy for just the domestic economy alone of about 3,200 petajoules. So you'll see those. And then we can compare those sizes. So if we were to supply the entire domestic economy with solar, we'd need an area that roughly is equivalent to all of the sugarcane that we grow. Uh, if we do it with 50-50 wind and solar, we, it's a little bit smaller than if we took all of our uh, suburbia. Um, if we did it all with wind, it's a little bit less than all of our defense land. Um, just for reference, Sydney or Greater Sydney is about 12,000 petajoules. So two of those if we do to 700% or a fraction of Sydney, Greater Sydney to do 100%. Another way to look at it, many of you are aware of our fabulous North-South Railway, the GAN, and our East-West Railway, the Indian Pacific. Uh, we would need a three kilometer wide solar array alongside each of those, North to South and East to West, to supply the 700% uh, 21,000 petajoule model or it would be two greater Sydneys, which is um, all the way from north of Gosford to south of Wollongong, all the way out to the Blue Mountains. Uh, so it is a sizable imprint on the nation. It would be about one third of Tasmania to do 700% renewables. So we could technically do it, but given those land areas, we may want to be smart about how to do 200-ish percent instead, or perhaps even consider some nuclear um, to you know, mostly in the land use trade-off. And remember that Australia is one of the lowest population density, best renewable resource countries in the world. So we have the best outlook of all here uh, of being able to make more than we need. Quickly, we should talk about hydrogen. It's very um, uh, popular to talk about it in the press. I think we need to be much more realistic than the, the hype uh, that I see out there at the moment. So there's three forms of hydrogen. Uh, gray hydrogen is how we make it today. Uh, we do steam reformation from natural gas. But, um, the blue hydrogen is the idea that we will do the same steam reformation from natural gas. We'll create carbon dioxide, but we'll sequester it. But um, as you'll remember a few weeks ago, I think we should temper our enthusiasms for sequestration for space, cost, and practical reasons. There'll be some, but not a huge amount. Um, green hydrogen is new entrant in the hydrogen story, which is we create renewable electricity and we electrolyze hydrogen from water. So let's have a look at that. So one of the ma my main objections to really a big um, 
amount of hydrogen is the efficiencies. So let's think about hydrogen for electricity storage and compare it to an all electric battery at the top. So once the electricity is made, we'll lose about 5% in the transmission, we'll lose a little bit more uh, storing in the battery uh, and from wind turbine or solar cell to using it in your kitchen or in your car, about 90% efficiency. If we use the same electricity via electrolysis, even if you do it thermodynamically perfectly, you'll lose about 17% in the electrolysis. And remember, in, in practically, that means an 83% efficient process. In, in practice, it's more like 70 to 75. So these are optimistic uh, in favor of hydrogen. When you compress hydrogen, which is what you need to do to, um, you need to compress it to 800 bar to be able to ship it anywhere, you use about 15% of the energy content of the hydrogen in that compression process. Um, in the transportation, we'd have to move it quite large distances. You'll lose a few percent. It's the same as analogous to the transmission cost of electricity. And when you burn it under combustion to make electricity again, uh, you might end up with 50% uh, efficient process there at the end. So you get 35% or about a third of the electricity at end use that you would if you just went straight from electricity through batteries. What about through a fuel cell? Much the same. Fuel cells a little better than burning it at the end. So you get about 41%, but you're still not even half as good as electricity. Now think about that in the consequences of the land use. Um, so if we imagine doing the whole economy with hydrogen, you need two or three or four times as much land use as we just mentioned. So there's one way to temper it. What about for transportation? Again, all electric model at the top. Um, efficient to transmit, efficient to go into a battery. Motors, electric motors are very efficient, about 83% from wind turbine to wheel. Um, from electricity to hydrogen via combustion of a, in a combustion engine of hydrogen to torque, you'll get about 30, 40, 34% um, in the best of all worlds uh, and via a fuel cell about 37%. Again, twice as good uh, not going through hydrogen. Um, what about hydrogen for low temperature heat? Um, Beautiful thing about heat pumps, like we showed before, is you get more energy, more heat energy out than you do put electric energy in. Um, so because of that, what they call coefficient of performance, about 3.5, you'll get 324% or 3.2 units of heat energy for every one unit of electricity you put in. If you go electricity to hydrogen to fuel cell to heat pump, less than half. And if you go all electric to resistant heat, that should say there, um, you'll get about 83%. But if you go all electric to hydrogen to combustion to make heat, only about 66%. So huge advantage there again in favor of electricity with heat pumps. Um, and then this is for high temperature heat, shouldn't say transportation top there, should say high temperature heat, um, all electric to high temperature heat where you can really only use resistive heating, 90%, 60% for hydrogen via combustion and 40% for electricity to hydrogen to a fuel cell to electricity to resistive heat again. So um, the best of all worlds for hydrogen is for combustion for heat. You, so maybe only that 60 to that 90% uh, spread there, but it's still not perfect story. Um, people tout hydrogen for its energy density of 123 megajoules per kilogram. That compares to 45 megajoules for petrol per kilogram or about a one megajoule per kilogram for lithium batteries. But that ignores that you have to have a tank, that the motors have different efficiencies and there's motor weights and fuel cell weights, etc., etc. In reality, you need at minimum five kilograms of you know very strong carbon fiber tank for every kilogram of hydrogen you store. It might be as more like 10 if it's uh, fiberglass. Um, and you can sort of multiply out those efficiency and those losses. It's really only about four, two to four megajoules per kilogram in the practical real world. For a petrol diesel, four and a half ish uh, for lithium batteries, they don't lose a lot, so about one. So the spread is much smaller than we are made to believe by the scaremongers. Um, and the vehicles, for example, are not as uh, weight sensitive as you might think. Hydrogen for 
cost is the other argument. So the stretch goal for Australia is two dollars a kilogram. Uh, that's six cents per kilowatt hour, um, effectively. Uh, that's the translation. But if you multiply out that 123 megajoules per kilogram. Solar, we're seeing industrial solar go in at two and a half cents a kilowatt hour throughout the world. If you have to harden that with batteries by the mid-century, uh, mid-decade 2025 price of batteries, about seven cents a kilowatt hour. Natural gas at the wholesale port price is about three and a half cents. It's about double that um, industrially and, and more uh, residentially. Coal at $120 a ton is about two and a half cents per kilowatt hour. That's only as heat. Um, it's significantly more expensive as uh, electricity. Um, again, that doesn't include all the features. You need compression, you need tanks, you need fuel cells. So you'll spend two cents a kilowatt hour to do that compression. Um, that's not even counting for the capex for the compressor, for the tank. Um, Let's be the very optimistic number, five kilograms of tank per kilogram of hydrogen. It's about $20 a kilogram. That's the price for carbon fiber composites to do that. You might get 2000 cycles out of that tank, but that means you have to use it daily, not once or twice a year. Uh, that'll add another four cents. Um, and then that brings you up, you know, six cents plus two plus four is 12 cents a kilowatt. So it starts to look very expensive compared to that um, solar or solar plus battery price. What about as a reducing agent? Uh, this is a, a better idea. Um, the ultimate, you know, people want to use hydrogen to as the, re, the reducing agent for steel. Um, but there's, why do we want to use hydrogen? Um, because it has a couple of electrons. Uh, the other approach, and that's the, the hybrid steel approach. The other approach is one championed by an old professor from MIT uh, through Boston Metals, which is doing electrochemistry directly as the reducing agent, which I think is more likely to be the successful pathway. Not quite at scale yet. But the real story for hydrogen is people champion it because it's a national security issue. So I've highlighted here Germany and Japan, they didn't have liquid fuels um, in any quantities during World War II, it was a real struggle for them against America, which had uh, access to a huge amounts of oil by comparison. Both countries invested heavily in trying to do gasification of coal so they could have something uh, like a liquid fuel. Um, and it's that, you know, they lost, in some respects, they lost the war because of, partly because of uh, those energy issues. And so they and many other countries are very concerned about having a domestic high density liquid or gaseous fuel. And they've been huge champions of hydrogen and their significant trading partners from with Australia, we've inherited some of that. Um, people advocate for hydrogen because they don't, you know, if you have a single electrical transmission line going from one country to another, it's a single point of failure and the countries imagine hydrogen is more secure because they can source it from five or six different places. So I think this is partly responsible for why people are still advocating it, uh, advocating for it. It might ultimately be partly responsible for why Australia gets to export more than would be thermodynamically or economically wise um, as people, as countries try to hedge their bets. Australia is one of the few places that can afford the excess to make a lot of hydrogen because we have so much land and such great renewables, but it's probably going to be a much smaller portion than uh, people in the media and governments at the moment are thinking about and planning for. So I think we should be cautious and invest more wisely in electrification. So where will we make our exports if it's not um, all in hydrogen? Uh, well, here are our exports today. Iron ore is the biggest one up in the top left hand corner. Coal and LNG or petroleum gas uh, are more together than our iron ore. They are in the in the bottom. So, and the color code here is uh, metals in dark gray. Uh, sorry, minerals in dark gray, metals in blue, processed metals, fossil fuels in red, agriculture in yellow. And you can look all the way down into the tiny little details in the corner there. I'll quiz you all on those numbers later. Um, we already embed energy and emissions in our exports. So this is the 
224 megatons of carbon dioxide that's in, that we that counts against Australians in the international um, IPCC uh, accounting for these things, the UN's accounting on emissions. Uh, but as you can see, a huge amount of it supports our metals exports and our fossil fuels exports and our agricultural exports. That shouldn't surprise you. Um, and it turns out that it's about 1200 petajoules of the energy we use in our domestic economy is what enables exporting 15,000 petajoules of fossil fuels. This is the diesel that runs the trains that take the coal from the mine to the port, for example. It's the um, coal that we use here to make the electricity to do some domestic processing of aluminum exports, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are our imports on the other hand. And then you can see the biggest three relate to uh, Australia's guilty pleasure, which is our cars. Uh, so the cars themselves, about 16 billion a year, uh, about a million vehicles a year. Um, and then 25 billion, this is all in US dollars for um, filling them with petrol and diesel. Um, we also import energy from other countries. So for example, it's about a nice study down here you can reference later, 42 megajoules per kilogram is the embodied energy in a car, average car, let's assume it weighs 1354, at least that's what, what uh, Google told me. There's about a million cars a year in Australia. That adds up to 52 petajoules of energy that we are importing. So, you know, a fraction, uh, slightly more than 1% of our domestic economy is energy imported in the form of cars. We don't count it that way, of course. Um, if you counted all of our imports and assume that they all have roughly the same embodied energy per kilogram of cars, it's about 650 petajoules. So again, you know, 10 to 20% of our domestic economy energy we import in uh, embodied in the products that we bring in from overseas. Back on our exports, um, here they are by dollar value in 2019. Obviously the huge standouts are iron ore, gold and fossil fuels. Um, but I'm gonna focus in on these, our metal ores, iron, copper, zinc, manganese, aluminum, al aluminum or aluminum uh, and precious metal ores. Here is the aluminum story today. So I'm gonna move my face to cover the, the punchline at the bottom. We currently earn about $16 billion from our aluminum exports. We mine about 100 million tons or 100 megatons of bauxite each year. Um, we earn $1.5 billion for exporting, exporting about a third of it. Uh, we reduce our ore to about 65, 66 megatons of ore to about 20 megatons of alumina domestically. We make quite a lot of money, $10 billion, uh, exporting the majority of that alumina. We take a small amount of that alumina, convert it to aluminum, and we make about $4 billion exporting aluminum. What if you could say we decided to take everything that we weren't exporting as alumina, all of that bauxite, and process it into aluminum or aluminium, and turns out we'd be able to make 13.2 megatons of aluminum in addition to our alumina, and we'd earn $38 billion for that so that'd be 48 billion. That would be substantially more, obviously, 32 billion dollars, um, more than it costs for all of our imported oil uh, if we were just to up process um, our bauxite domestically with our cheap uh, domestic renewables. Similar story here for steel. Uh, we currently earn about 79 billion dollars for the exports. We ex, you know, we mine. Close to a billion tons, we export 800 million tons, we make 78 billion on that. Uh, we make about 5.5 million tons of steel domestically, uh, and we export uh, about 1.2 million tons of that for a billion dollars in earnings. If we up processed all of our iron ore domestically into steel, it would be worth $707 billion and the renewable electricity required to do it would be 15,000 petajoules, equivalent to all of our exports in fossil fuels today. And in fact, if we go back to um, aluminum, we'd need 2,500 petajoules um, 
to uh, process all of that bauxite. So um, easily could replace our fossil fuel uh, export industries with just up processing a small fraction of just these two ores uh, domestically. And this is how you could make up that 700% renewables or two or 300% if you, um, you know, wanted to stop at just earning 200 billion on exporting steel. So up processing our metal ores makes us a 500 to 1000% renewable country if we want. It's gonna drastically increase our export earnings. Um, and really we only need a small fraction, like I said, to make up the export losses that are driving the fear bus in the climate conversation. Australia, we really have the opportunity to be the world's foundry. So let's look at some of the critical metals and materials required for the global clean energy transition. Iron, because that's what it takes to build uh, the towers for wind turbines, the framing for solar, the rebar for hydroelectricity, the body for the electric bodies for the electric vehicles, um, and you know a lot of the components of the transmission grid. Australia has 29% of the world's known resources. Similarly, we are extremely well endowed with aluminum, which we need for transmission lines, again, electric vehicles, solar and batteries, copper, all of the above, obviously, motors, solar transmission, electric vehicles, etc. manganese, zinc, nickel, cobalt, tin, all of these were the first, second, third or fourth largest producer in the world. Uranium, we have 30% of the world supply. We currently only make $50 billion exporting small amounts of it. We could use some of it domestically or not. We, have, we are lucky that we will not need to use nuclear energy to meet our energy needs, but many other countries in the world have too many people in too small a space, so they will need nuclear energy and we could make, we could substantially increase our export earnings there. Obviously lithium, which we didn't even rate in the 2019 uh, exports, uh, we have to, close to 20% of it, and that's going to be hugely impactful for batteries. Uh, for the average Australian or American, you'd need about 50 kilograms of solar made every year, to uh, year after year, to sort of be the sustainable amount of solar to supply someone's lifetime, because they wear out after 30 years. Same with wind turbines, and about 50 kilograms of wind turbines per person per year, and you'll need 50 to 100 kilograms of batteries per person per year. So this one will grow the fastest and, and be quite enormous uh, within the decade. We also have the rare earths. Australia is swimming in the key metals, minerals for the energy transition the world needs to go by, go through. Of course, we could be even cleverer than just mining. We could make some batteries ourselves and, and start manufacturing again. We should also make solar cells. We should make wind turbines. We could easily make at least some of our electric vehicles and maybe even some heat pumps. These industries all have to grow enormously. We are currently only producing, uh, we need to get to steady state and providing the entire world with renewables. You just use a naive assumption of 50% or 40% solar, 40% wind and 20% for everything else. Um, solar production rates globally need to increase by about 12x wind turbine production rates need to in increase by about 10x, batteries by more than 10x, electric vehicles by 10x. Um, so there's plenty of room to grow into these and have enormous export businesses. I'm gonna make a last point and then wrap up about how more electrification begets more electrification. So I'm using any data from the United States here, but it's quite similar in Australia, just that uh, in Australia, January is July and July is January. This is the solar production throughout the year, mapped to that calendar in the US, which is counter correlated with the wind production. So um, it's windy in the summer when the summer heats up the land and creates the temperature differentials to create wind. And it's sunny in the summer. Um, uh, sorry, windy in the winter and, and sunny in the, in the summer. Um, here's the demand for the different sectors. So the main sectors in the US are residential. You can see in winter, lots of high heating loads. Um, then in the 
shoulder periods, so the mild seasons, spring and autumn. Uh, the energy demand is lowest in residential in the summer, of course, high air conditioning loads in Australia, that's proportionally higher again. Uh, the transportation loads, it turns out that people drive a little bit less in the winter and they drive in the, you know, around the holiday seasons. Um, our, whereas commercial follows the residential loads because it's mostly about building heat uh, and building energy loads and then um, industry is pretty flat across the year. If you superimpose all of them, the loads, because they counter-correlate also, they flatten out. There's not a huge amount of variation across the seasons. And here's a fairly radical idea. This takes the last 25 years of solar data for the US, uh, same for wind. We just assume a fairly naive mix of maybe 50% wind, 40% solar, 10% nuclear, a little bit of geothermal, hydro and bio for good measure. And then we take that, that, that would be how you would produce. Um, what we've done is we've actually designed for overcapacity. This is again, the, the future of renewables can easily be one of abundance. So we designed the total size of the system for the winter minimum or which is the, the the, with the winter maximum of energy use. And then you can see if you're designing that, then you have overcapacity for the rest of the year, but it's only 20, 25% of the overcapacity. And I think this is a hugely important point. Um, the sector coupling makes things easier because it averages things out. And the with 20% of overcapacity, if we're producing our electricity at four cents with wind and solar, it's only a marginal cost of, you know, half a cent to one cent per kilowatt hour to have that overcapacity and meet all of your loads throughout all of the seasons. That's going to be far cheaper than batteries or hydrogen. Um, so I think we, we need to start changing our mindset of like, we're going to struggle to get to hundred percent. So we, we're going to have abundance. Um, the other important point for Australia is our industrial electricity demand. If we are, um, using renewable electricity to up process, much more of our steel, aluminum, and other metals, those, those industrial loads will dwarf our domestic residential commercial demands. Um, and because there's such huge thermal loads and industry can dial them up and down, industry will effectively act as a huge low cost battery for Australians um, if we choose to, and I think we should cross couple all the sectors. So connect them all to the same national transmission grid. There's a huge amount to win there. So that's it. I, it's, I have an incredibly rosy out, outlook for Australia if we choose to do it, which is obviously in great question. We, we certainly do not have the policies yet that are tracking towards a vision that looks like this. Um, the jobs in the regions, there's going to be a huge number of them, particularly if we take on these, this ore processing. Uh, there's going to be savings in the suburbs and jobs in the suburbs. The outlook is good for our castles. In many respects, in terms of climate solutions, Australia is the not just the lucky country, but the luckiest. We have the best, renew best renewables. We have low population density. We have incredible resources, and we have the resources that the world needs for this transition. We have the most to win, but we also have the most to lose because it is such a fragile uh, nation already with uh, a tempestuous climate only getting worse and we have beautiful features like the Great Barrier Reef which we stand to lose very sadly in the next few decades unless we act very decisively. Now uh, that's it for me that's Rewiring Australia. Uh, I hope you join me in convincing our politicians to go to Glasgow um, with the world's most audacious climate policy. I think as you know there's no reason Scott Morrison shouldn't stand up at Glasgow and say, I'm sorry, everyone. I know we've been dragging our feet a little bit, but uh, Australia would like to show you all um, how to solve this climate change. And we're going to go first. We're going to go hardest. We know what the vaccine for climate change is. Um, the vaccine for climate change is electrification. And just like with COVID, you have to go hard and you go early. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to decarbonize the domestic economy in the next decade by 2030 and we'll decarbonize our export industry uh, by 2040 
And in doing so, Australia could easily uh, show the world the pathway to a one and a half or as close as we can get target. Thanks very much. Saul, so, thank you so much for that second talk. Uh, I think it really amplified some of the messages from the first, but also gave a new insight into the options that countries have. And Australia in particular, I think, with our massive geological resources, uh, but also the opportunity to use a new energy revolution to electrify everything. I think it's been really helpful also to think about that at the household level in the first uh, talk, where the household was a proxy for the people part of the economy. And we've now also dealt with the export part of the economy. And you're talking about a radical shift. But to get this done, uh, the kind of connecting glue is the grid. And we had a couple of questions from the first uh, talk, and I'm sure coming out of this talk, there will also be some questions about the grid. Do you want to reflect on this, uh, this structure, the grid that holds everything together and moves uh, the electrons from one place to another? Uh, it's in a, the American grid has been described as the largest machine that humans have ever built because it is, um, you know, so many tens of thousands, it's over a million miles of lines. There's 185 million of those utility poles. That's the distribution grid, um, huge numbers of substations. So the, the, this is an enormous and complicated machine. And we, when we built it, out originally, which was the first half of the 20th century, um, you know, it was still an era of slide rules and conservative design principles and design rules. And so the whole, whole grid had to be synchronous. We had the AC, DC war, AC one. Uh, that's why it has to be synchronous. Uh, we're having that war again right now um, in an interesting way. Uh, and it was built around design rules of having large centralized uh, machinery that had spinning mass, which meant it had inertia. And we're still even using the notions of that spinning mass and that inertia to describe the challenges of the new grid. Whereas now we have solid state electronics that can switch at unbelievable speeds, actually resolving that, you know, you can be, all of the sources can be asynchronous and synchronized in, in, in hardware along the way. Um, we have to make it connect to many more end use devices. We're going to have a much larger set of generation facilities. Um, it really is quite a transformation. And I think it is sobering to understand that for any country, substantially upgrading the grid is upgrading or rebuilding the biggest machine in the country. Um, in Australia, the interesting thing that ties together the household conversation to the industry exports conversation um, because the ratio of our export energy consumption is is so high relative to our residential loads and our commercial loads that in Australia what we do in how we play out that exports future hugely impacts how easy or how difficult the residential problem is and I, I mentioned it briefly in the talk but you know if we are really a five six seven hundred percent renewable country um, it is relatively, you know, that represents so much, so many energy transactions that balancing our domestic grid will be quite easy um, and we'll need far fewer batteries. So, um, you know, I think Australia has unusual and advantageous choices to make in how that grid plays out. The second grid is, is, is uh, one that I think about a lot, which is, which is transportation. Um, transportation works well with batteries in something the size of an automobile. Uh, maybe batteries can go through uh, a phase of getting higher energy density, but it's not going to get to a factor of five. It's probably a factor of two. That's my sort of estimate. For the long haul stuff across Australia at the moment with the big road trains, um, is that a different sort of a solution once you're thinking about uh, moving goods and, uh, you know, large amounts of materials uh, around Australia to ports and to other places? And also when you're thinking about moving things across the sea, what changes in this electrify uh, everything? Uh, do we go for fuel cells and um, 
sort of carbon cycle free uh, uh, fuels. Um, uh, what's the change that happens to, to the transportation grid, which is about 40% of our utilization of, of, of energy? I'm a little more optimistic for batteries. I, I see solid state batteries maybe getting us five, five times the power density or even more. And as you sort of, if you take the whole systems analysis, that'll get batteries up to about five megajoules a kilogram sort of um, engine to wheel. And that's about what diesel or petrol is effectively. So um, I think we nearly get there. But I also think uh, we could go with, you know, there's more than enough biofuels just from waste, forestry, waste, food, even our sewage waste. Uh, if we learn to process that into things that look like diesel, the biofuels are enough to cover our long haul aviation and our long distance shipping uh, and probably even our long road freight. Um, we did a little bit of work. I also think some imagination required. Um, I did a lot of work in wind energy a decade ago, including studies on how you would do uh, hybrid sailing ships uh, for the world's routes. It turns out in 1900, the fastest schooners were consistently averaging 12 knots across the Atlantic. And 100 years later in 2010, we were only averaging 14 or 15 knots on most uh, vessels. So, you know, if you slightly more advanced wind, made it that a hybrid with solar, I think you can pick up those extra knots and probably be very close to competitive. Um, I think we will start to question the need for speed with good logistics uh, on both ends. Can you make up the difference of, you know, a, a 10 or 20% slower tanker? The same is true with uh, trucks. You know, we, what, is, what are the rules of trucks? They are only allowed to drive for 12 hours a day or 10 hours a day because of the driver. Um, then they have to stop. So we've got these 100 and kilometer an hour trucks that are over 24 hour period, they're only doing 40 or 50 kilometers an hour. You know, we are on long straight stretches of road, autonomous driving is quite easy. It's cities that are difficult, it's not long stretches. If that truck can do 50 kilometers an hour for the whole 24 hour period, it covers as much time. And as everyone who does any aerodynamics knows, you get a, a it's the, the aerodynamic drag which dominates is the square of the speed. So. It's, it's less than a quarter of the energy. And then all of a sudden you could generate enough solar on that road train to drive the same distance in a day because it's such a long vehicle with so much area. You know, they are creative and imaginative solutions, things like that road train that's autonomous and slower, things like the slightly slower boat that has better import logistics. But I think you have to put the equal weight on solutions like that emerging that come from slight changes in practice as well as changes in technology, which is the substitute for fuel path, which is hydrogen or methanol or ammonia, um, however you wish to, or methane, however you wish to try and make a synthetic fuel. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting synthesis. Um, you know, speed up by slowing down is uh, what you're talking about, is uh, you know, using all of the time that's available in a, in a different way. Right. It, it, I think what we are talking about when we start talking about electrifying everything is uh, very much an industrial revolution, which was embedded within your talk as well. Uh, that Australia has to choose not to make certain things um, and we have to choose to make other things. Now, complex factor manufacturing has been something that Australia has wrestled with. We, we like the hole in the ground and we like the benefits of the other end of, of the so-called smile. But in the middle, we're not very good, uh, where you're in the value adding stages and you're in the uh, complex integration of many technologies. Is that an inherent feature of the Australian psyche that we don't like to do that hard stuff in the middle? Uh, we like the easy bit at the beginning and put in a ship and then we wait for the resources to return in terms of quality of life. I, I hardly think of myself as an old man, but I now have to recognize that my life feels like it's been a 40 years of this conversation. Um, I went to a technical high school, which tracked all of the boys who went to that high school towards engineering degrees. 
And then those engineering degrees all tracked us towards essentially going into primary processing. And along the entire school and university journey, the professors would lament that we weren't up processing and doing more advanced manufacturing and, and the things in the middle of that smile. I still believe there is some hope for that, but I would also have to acknowledge that I think the political and socioeconomic trends are against us. There are 2 billion people who will still work for about $2 a day. Yeah, um, yeah. That is a prodigious human resource. Uh, you cannot, I've owned a number of these big robotic arms in my life. It takes, it costs more than $2 a day to run electricity to them. That's how efficient, prolifically efficient the human body and mechanism is. Um, and so I, I think even with automation, uh, the demographics of the world, you know, there's still whole entire economies and countries where there will be low cost labor that might make us moving into some of those uh, industries challenging. Um, that said, you know, I think it's possible to, you know, there's, there's companies in China now that will set, sell you the electric skateboard. That's basically the battery, the motors and the wheels and the drivetrain. Uh, the automobile industry was originally about coach building. The Australian vehicle vernacular, if you like, is very different to the rest of the world. You could imagine that we go into the coach building. That means everything above the wheels uh, and have a domestic auto industry again. Um, if we are truly to be a seven, eight hundred percent renewable country, it would be insane to be importing all of that solar and all of those wind turbines. Uh, so you can imagine domestic manufacturing um, for some of those, highly automated for sure. Uh, big heavy things like wind turbines, especially shipping, is a is a challenging component. Um, so I think there is a lot of opportunities, particularly in this transition, to move up that up that curve or you know turn the smile upside down if you like yeah. um but i think the the piece of me that began saying you know i've heard this conversation for 40 years i'm not sure that we should be hopeful uh -huh. we might in fact and that's why in that talk i really focused on look if all we do is you know the bare minimum amount of primary processing just going from ore to base metal um, maybe that's all the ambition we need that's interesting you know, you and I both come out of a materials kind of background, materials engineering. I, I sneaked in a course on the molecular biology of the gene um, in my final year at, at, uh, at my undergraduate level. And I've, I've, I've followed the developments in, in modern biology. And um, I, I suspect that in some ways we are on the cusp potentially of a biological revolution. So some of this hardwired sort of battery and, and, and electricity earth could be modified by, by uh, aspects of synthetic biology. That's obviously going to affect medicine and quality of life uh, down the track, but it can also go to energy production in some new ways. Do you see anything in, in the next generation of synthetic biology? I guess we're at sort of stage two now, where there might be breakthroughs where, again, harvesting the sun, but without putting it through a solar panel, putting it directly into a goop and getting out valuable stuff might become important. Um. It sounds like we share something. I snuck a few courses in biology and even synthetic, well, synthetic biology as a discipline emerged from a class I was taking with Xu Guang Zhang at MIT. And one of the postdocs he had was a fellow called Drew Endy and he and I were windsurfing buddies. And he and a guy who was teaching my computing class, Tom Knight, um, they inspired to develop synthetic biology so that's how do we treat the component pieces of biology as computer code and and build these biological machines from the ground up it was i i took a number of classes and you know we like stayed awake at night thinking about it i think that has a huge number of applications obviously in, in pharmaceuticals healthcare but what has always excited me the most is um, bulk biological materials as a substitute for our heat and beat. So all of the human, you know, the, the majority of human materials are, ste are metals that, or glasses where we use very, very high temperatures. Biology can obviously build profoundly strong and profoundly high performance materials at room temperature, at ambient pressure. And I've joked with friends, you know, if I could 
artificially synthesized cockroach wings or even my fingernails, they would make the perfect surfboard. They would even be tougher and stronger and lighter than surfboards. Mm. I hold out hope for um, actually, you know, one more anecdote, a, a friend, um, Phil Ross, who lives in San Francisco, uh, just near where I'm talking from today, he is making leather out of mycelium from mushrooms and has a commercial company doing very well now selling handbags and leather alternatives that are grown from mushrooms. None of the carbon emissions associated with growing the cow. Um, I think what he's doing is the exciting forefront. That's using these biology materials to turn sunlight into highly programmed, highly structured, recyclable natural materials that take over the, you know, that become substitutes for our plastics, that become substitutes for our metals. Uh, the reason we need to do it, for example, you know, 2% of America's energy is in the paper pulp industry which is creating a huge number of structural products for our built environment. Um, we don't know how to grow wood yet, but if you could figure out how to program your synthetic biology to grow perfect sheets of plywood on the surface of a swimming pool bioreactor, um, I think that's a spectacular way to both use solar energy, eliminate industrial emissions and make um, alternatives to plastics for our built environment. I think that's great. You synthesize two, two areas. The one is the, the, the biology piece, but the other one, which is underplayed in Australia, is biomimetics, looking at biological systems and trying to engineer systems that mimic those or, in fact, take from them and build structural uh, elements and so on. Uh, and, I that is, and that is the big, uh, that is where the field is. Right. So far, we've only been able to make Lego bricks. Yeah but we haven't been able to make the Lego bricks make a machine that can then array the, you know, program the Lego bricks to build you a Lego city. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the, that's the difference between being an amoeba and being a tree. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'd agree with that. And, 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 and the mystery of that and, and the excitement of that for a new generation of engineers and researchers is actually not to invent our engineering from a replay of the industrial revolution but a reappreciation of the natural world and then build out of that, you know, perhaps a, a safer and a more pleasant world for everybody. I suspect that that could be an Australian revolution. Uh, two of the four types of photosynthesis were discovered by Australians. Um, and so right at the end of this, you know, is that, is that sort of photon coming from the sun that has got that amazing uh, potential to, to kind of split, uh, split up the carbon. I, I uh, if you talk to I talk to Tom Knight and George Church about this often. They're big luminaries in their field, and it's not impossible to imagine getting upwards of ten, even close to twenty percent, with a, a biologic, an artificial biological photosynthesis. At which point, things get very exciting. Yeah, um, the latest literature I've seen is twenty-one percent, so it's getting close. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's that's a dream that we should have as well. Um, just just, some... I'll give you one other dream that's on that point. Um, the energy density of food is about the same as diesel and the thermodynamic efficiency of our gut is about 50%. So in the energy density from food to muscle, humans and mammals are about 20 megajoules a kilogram. Remember that I just showed you that a, the diesel powered, even hydrogen powered machines are four or five megajoules per kilogram. This is why our robots uh, look clumsy, are slow, are weak. Um, so I, you know, I, I love that we've come, we're, we're finishing with some, not even science fiction, some actually just very genuinely exciting science. But um, if, even if we don't get 20% efficient, uh, photosynthesis out of synthetic biology, if we could get a synthetic muscle substitute, we could change the design of all machines and make locomotion hugely more efficient, for example. Yeah, yeah. And that'll set up for the next time that we talk with you because we started with castles which are made of rocks and crushed rocks which are made of rocks. <laughs> uh, but we're now talking about a deeply organic world which is much more integrated into what it's trying to achieve. Um, I think it's been fabulous, uh, Carl. Thank you for your thoughtfulness, your, your commitment, your energy, and your synthesis of really big ideas. It's been a great help, I think, to, to me to uh, spend time with you. I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. I've, uh, I think that 
the Royal Society of New South Wales is privileged to have you as a, as a fellow uh, and as somebody who's helped us think. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm, I feel privileged in return for uh, being accepted as a member. Thank you. Great. There's not much left for me to say except please join me in thanking on behalf of the Society, Dr. Saul Griffith and Addie Patterson for providing their expertise and insights on the potential of Australia's energy system to address global warming as well as increase our prosperity. I think we should give them a virtual clap. I'm sure you will agree that this series gives life to the society's vision of enriching lives through knowledge and inquiry. Today's part two will soon join part one on the society's YouTube channel, which you can access via the homepage of the society's website. Thank you all for contributing your questions and for participating in this series.